Good evening, everyone. And welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Katherine Schwab, and I'm one of the 2024-2025 Athenaeum Fellows. I'd like to extend a special welcome to those of you who are attending the ATH for the first time. The ATH is one of the most unique and enriching spaces at CMC, and I'm excited to see how it'll shape your experience here. Tonight, we are joined by a special guest, a graduate of CMC's class of 2009, who has dedicated her career to unraveling the complexities of food, agriculture, and climate change, topics that touch all of our lives in profound ways. Helena bottomiller Evich is the founder and editor-in-chief of Food Fix, a publication that dives deep into food policy in Washington and beyond. Prior to founding Food Fix, Helena was a senior reporter at Politico, where she led the food and agriculture coverage for nearly a decade. Her investigative work has garnered numerous awards, including two James Beard Awards and a prestigious George Polk Award. In her 2022 reporting on the infant formula crisis in particular, helped drive significant reforms within the FDA. Helena's talk tonight will address the politics of food, agriculture, and climate change in the United States, exploring why it is so challenging to adopt climate-friendly policies and how these issues are playing a role in the upcoming presidential election. She will also look ahead at what's next for Washington when it comes to regulating food and agriculture. As attitudes toward climate change evolve among both farmers and consumers, the politics around these topics remain as complex as ever. Helena will unpack these challenges and dive into whether the US might ever follow other nations in considering environmental sustainability in our dietary recommendations. Can consumers really trust food that's labeled as climate friendly? Helena will share stories from her years as a journalist covering these critical topics in Washington, giving us a clearer understanding of the landscape. In addition to her reporting, Helena is, has appeared on major networks like CNN, PBS, BBC, and NPR to provide insights on food policy. Her work is frequently cited across the media and has also appeared in outlets such as the Columbia Journalism Review and NBC News. Tonight's talk is part of Robert's Environmental Center's Sustainable Food Initiative for the 2024-2025 academic year. And we are incredibly fortunate to hear directly from Helena herself. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Helena bottomiller Evich to the podium. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I am thrilled to be here. Um, I loved the app when I was a student here. It's one of the reasons I chose CMC. Um, I remember I got to see Salman Rushdie. I think he'd like come out of hiding to talk to us a decade ago. Um, I got to, you know, George Will, Al Sharpton. I got to meet the late Justice, Justice Antonin Scalia. I was here when they locked Karl Rove in with the protests. Have you guys heard this story? There were anti-war protests. Karl Rove was locked in here for, I want to say hours, fact check me, a long time. He was trapped in here. There was also a counter protest to, um, you know, I guess support Karl Rove. I mean, it was just pandemonium. So I have a lot of very fond memories in this room and it's just really, um, wonderful to be back. I have to say campus is quite a bit nicer than when I was here. Um, I, uh, I had to play volleyball in a gym that did not have air conditioning. And my coach, DT Graves, who I guess has a very big job, is like basically running the place now, was the volleyball coach. And she had us doing double days in that gym. It was so hot. And so you guys really are, um, are in some nice facilities here, so I hope you're enjoying it. Um, I also want to say that it is so nice to see um, Professor Jack Pitney, who was, I think, my favorite professor on campus. I think I can say that because I don't know that there are other professors here that would, I would be offending. I'm pretty sure I hit the limit of how many classes you're allowed to take with Pitney. I don't actually know if there was a limit, but I was told at some point that you couldn't take more than four classes, and I took four. Um, really, it's been a delight to stay in touch with um, with Jack Pitney and in Washington, I've run into so many other CMC alum who are also part of the Pitney fan club and it's quite, it's quite a group. 
Um, I also want to thank um, the Roberts Environmental Center for hosting me, for hosting this talk. Or this talk. I think it's really great that you're doing a series on um, sustainable food. Um, love to see it. I kind of felt a little bit alone being interested in food policy while I was here, but in talking to the students, I understand this is much a much greater interest now, and I think that's great. Um, I also want to thank Brian Davidson, who um, invited me and did a lot of the logistics for this talk. I think it's great to see him running things here for now, hopefully forever. I don't know. He's doing a great job. And um, we overlapped a bit at CMC. It's just really great to see alumni back here in leadership roles, and I, I love to see it. Um, so today, I'm going to talk just a little bit about my career path, just a little bit, because I, I can basically draw a straight line from my time at CMC to what I'm doing now. Um, then we're going to walk through how food and agriculture fits into the climate landscape. Some of this you may know, some of it may not. I don't know that we still have food policy classes here, so maybe this will be new to a lot of you. Um, well, I know on other campuses, I mean CMC, right? You're not as focused. So um, we're then gonna talk about why it is so politically sensitive to talk about climate and agriculture and to you know dive into these policies. And then lastly, we're gonna look at how these issues are currently playing in the presidential election. And I know you guys just had a debate or a debate watching party here. Was anyone here for that? Are you guys all ATH regulars? No. Yes. OK, great. Um, let's see here. So just to just to begin, so my I wrote my thesis on FDA politics. I thought, well, if I have to write a really long paper, I was a Gov major. I was interested in food. So I thought, well, I'm going to write a thesis that it's just a little bit different. I mean, God, I was in Papa. Is Papa Lab still here? Yeah, I spent a lot of hours in Papa, like ungodly hours. That was so stressful. And I thought, well, if I'm going to write a really long paper, I'm going to make it about something I'm personally interested in. And I ended up interviewing people for my thesis. And I highly recommend you do this if it's relevant to your thesis. I made some really good connections with people in food world, and I ended up getting a job out of college. Um, I helped launch Food Safety News, and I was like a little cub reporter running around Washington. I had no idea what I was doing. I was showing up to congressional hearings. I had truly no training other than Pitney's politics of journalism class, which I took for fun. I mean, I didn't know that I would fall into journalism. And so I ended up, you know, writing about food policy at Food Safety News for a couple of years. And then I went to, um, and then Politico actually asked me to come uh, start food and ag coverage there food and ag policy coverage. And that was a real treat, because I remember being in Applebee, reading Politico, which was like very new at the time. Um, I think that was during, like before Obama was elected, which makes me feel kind of old now when I think about it. But um, it, was, it, was a really, it was a really good experience. And I got to basically, I almost felt like I kept working on my thesis. And that's very unusual. I don't know that that's a typical career path, but I share it because you never know where your where your academic interests are going to lead you. I had no idea what I was going to do. I thought, I don't know, maybe I'd go answer phones on Capitol Hill. And just kind of taking that next interesting job or that next step has led me to a career that I love. And I share that because I feel like students are always so worried about knowing what they want to do or having a plan. It's going to be OK if you don't have a plan. So after Politico, oh, I'll show the, share this. So when I Right before I left Politico in 2022 to launch Food Fix, um, which we'll get into, I wrote this big investigation of FDA and the failings of the food program. And this was, I mean, truly, you could draw a straight line. Like, I actually got my thesis out when I was working on this. I had been following the FDA for so long from my thesis, so 2009, till this, I published this in 2022, that I could really see, I really had a good understanding of where this agency was not working and where it was. And this was a very long, very in-depth investigation we were able to write. And it happened to come, I couldn't have planned this, but it happened to come when the infant formula crisis was happening. And so this was sort of a perfect storm in Washington. All of a sudden, Congress was like, wait, what is FDA doing on food issues? Like, th this doesn't seem uh, very functional. The agency's response was quite slow. And there's all of these health and safety issues that have just been sticking around or being delayed for decades. Um, and I really, when you look at this, this is like one of the biggest stories I've, I've um, written. I was able to do this because of that academic interest that started very early and then I translated it into journalism. Um, and the story had a big impact. It's all over the congressional record, which again, it's very exciting when you're a gov major. So 
Um, and then, so I left in 2022 to launch Food Fix, which is um, a publication about food policy. Right now, it's just in the form of a twice a week newsletter, um, but it is part of this broader trend in media. So that's the other thing that you should know is that even if you go into an industry, it doesn't matter what industry it is, it can change. So journalism has basically been in free fall since I accidentally joined it. Um, layoffs, like business models in disarray. And with this new wave of sort of smaller, more independent, or um, they're mostly smaller. Some, a lot of these are journalist owned. We're seeing this bigger shift in media um, basically from institutions toward individuals. There's like a decentralization or splintering that's happening. And this is a whole other topic that I could do an ath talk on. And maybe I'll come back. You guys have been very nice. I'll come back and talk about it sometime. But um, this is a really important shift happening in media. And um, I, I mention it only because I'm very much a part of it. And also Puck um, is a, a publication that another CMC alum, it, some of you are nodding, you know, uh, Tina Nguyen works at Puck covering politics. So. I'm hoping that a more stable and sustainable media future is ahead of us with this new splintering of the American media, but I can't guarantee you it's, it's, it's kind of a shit show still, to be honest with you. Um, okay, so topic at hand, um, food and agriculture are actually like a pretty significant portion of the entire greenhouse gas emission um, landscape. These are this is a figure. These are um, figures that are global. So, um, depending on what, how you do the accounting, agriculture and food are usually between like a quarter and a third of global greenhouse gas emissions. So that's pretty significant. Um, and yet, we don't often hear political leaders, at least not in the U.S. And globally, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. We don't hear. Um, climate being talked about. We don't hear food and ag being talked about as like the response to climate change or sort of needing to focus on it. We're much more likely to hear about like energy policy or transportation. Um, but it really is a significant part of, or it's a really significant piece of the puzzle here. And then if, okay, so the other thing to know is like, you know, food and ag is basically the biggest way humans interact with the environment. So it's not just greenhouse gas emissions. This has 26%, but again, it's like how you do the accounting is how you get that number. 26% of greenhouse gas emissions come from food. 50% of the world's habitable land is used for agriculture. 70% of global fresh water is used for agriculture. Um, basically 78% of water pollution is tied to agriculture in some way. 94% um, of global mammal biomass, which that's a real tongue twister, but excluding humans is livestock. So we're talking about like physically just a lot of animals on the planet uh, for us to either eat or, you know, for eggs or dairy. And then 71% of global bird biomass is poultry livestock. So we're just talking about a really large scale, um, a big environmental footprint. And, you know, thankfully we're feeding billions of people. So uh, you know, it's important. It's, it's not, it's not inconsequential. Um, these are, the EPA does not make as good of charts, but this is from the EPA. Um, and if you drill down into the U.S., it's about 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the reason there is such a big discrepancy is the U.S. is just so efficient at producing food. So our, um, you know, we are, we are not going to use as much of our, um, of our energy on agriculture, but you know, it's pretty significant. We're talking like, you know, a third of transportation or almost half of like what electric power is. I mean, it's, it's fairly significant. And yet in the U.S. in particular, we do not tend to ever talk about food and ag as a major part of the climate response or what we do on climate policy. We will get into why that is. Um, this is another chart from EPA that kind of shows how the different sectors have been um, contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions like over time. So this is 1990 to 2022, I don't know when this ends. Um, but you can see, you know, there's been some uh, downward trends in like transportation. I imagine, I'm not a transportation expert, I'm gonna imagine some of that has to do with, um, you know, more efficient vehicles, changes in fuel, um, probably same thing for electric power. Agriculture is like pretty steadily 10%. Um, it is slightly going up, um, but how much that's significant is a whole other ball of wax. So we've established that food and ag is a major part of the like climate landscape. 
um, it is a major driver of greenhouse gas emissions. It is also, of course, one of the first ways that climate change, or it's on the front lines of climate change, right? So farmers are going to be the first to have to deal with um, more extreme weather. They have to deal with like crazy derechos and flooding, and like that's a very frontline response. So it's not only a major part of greenhouse gas emissions, but it's a, a very vulnerable to the effects of climate change. So this um, this is a story I think that kind of uh, illustrates how difficult it has been to try to get food and agriculture into the climate conversation. This is a story I wrote in 2014 about Sam Cass. I don't know if any of you know who this is, but this was um, during the Obama administration. This was actually um, a chef at the White House who became very influential on policy and was very, um, very instrumental in like First Lady Michelle Obama's Let's Move campaign, was just like very, you know, it was kind of misleading to only view Sam Cass as a chef. He was very involved in policy. And when he left the White House, I called him. I don't remember if I wrote this headline. Maybe I did. But it, this was accurate, right? It was a very powerful chef. He leaves the White House. And what does he do the next year? He goes to the Paris Climate Talks and is determined to get food and agriculture into, like, basically global leaders, get, like, caring about it. He was like, they should care about it. This is a major part of greenhouse gas emissions, and it could be part of the, you know, the response, the solution. And so Sam Cass went to Paris, cooked a dinner for a bunch of world leaders, um, talked about food waste. That's the other thing. About 30 to 40 percent of uh, food in the U.S. is wasted. That's everything from agriculture and on-farm to what's hopefully not rotting in your mini fridges. I don't know, but. Um, it's a lot of waste. And so he was talking about food waste. And then he was also talking to these world leaders about the, some of the foods that are the most vulnerable to climate change in the short term, things like coffee, um, chocolate, um, even wine. We're going to be shifting where we grow certain things. And you're like, oh, okay, well, maybe you guys like wine. I don't know. You're like, oh, that's just like a something. It's not essential. Well, it is pretty culturally essential to a lot of places. And um, so the whole point was to try to get these world leaders to connect the dots. I think at the time, Sam Cass was quoted as saying it was the first time in any UN sanctioned like climate gathering where world leaders were openly talking about the connection between food and agriculture and climate, which is astonishing to me. That's 2015. OK. Um, but it's been an, it's been kind of like pushing a boulder uphill. I think a lot of advocates who work on this have been frustrated over the years. Right. They they were so glad to see this happen. And then okay, we're going to fast forward to, we're going to go nine years forward to this year, or eight years, however you're measuring it. Um, this year, COP28, 2024, was called the, like, the first food COP. It was the first time where food really took center stage in terms of discussion, right? Not in terms of meaningful like policy change or commitment or anything like that, but really actually a topic of discussion. It was something that was present. Um, food is finally on the table. This is a headline um, that was in The Guardian. And, you know, it's, again, kind of astonishing that in 2024, they're finally like, oh, yeah, like, let's get to food. Um, of course, no one thinks twice about all the other sectors that you have to talk about when you um, are talking about a climate response. So I wrote about this in my newsletter, basically digging into like what did it actually mean though like we talked about climate or we saw climate talked about everyone who attended cop 28 basically came to the conclusion of like this was a huge deal because the connections were being made and like it really um got attention and it got momentum but the ag talks actually fell apart there was not like a lot of concrete anything that came out of this in terms of food and agriculture i think people would debate how much concrete anything came out of this, but um, it's just a reminder of how long it takes. Um, so this was actually in 2023, but you know, it, it took a long, long time. So why is it so hard? Well, the answer is politics. Um, it is so politically risky to go after farmers or to try to change how farmers farm. Who heard about this? Like Europe, yeah, probably most of you. This was huge. And this has been going on for a long time now. 
Um, in the EU, there has been a big push to try to integrate climate concerns into agricultural policy, and it has not gone well. Farmers have, this is uh, shutting down Brussels. They've done tractor cades on many major cities. They've dumped manure in some very unsettling place. I mean, a mess, right? Like there's a huge um, uprising. I think in the Netherlands, there was so much rebellion over a proposed policy there to try to reduce livestock production that um, the, the controlling party actually flipped. Like the farmers populist, I'm not an expert in Netherlands politics, it's very complicated, but essentially the farmers took control. Like, I mean, we are talking about real backlash, real populist backlash. Um, so it's really risky. Um, and of course, like not just in Europe, but especially in the US, like we view farmers as sort of this exceptional and also very important part of society. and. It's just a third rail issue to, um, to talk about regulating them. And that's not really even what we're talking about here. In the US, we have seen similar dust ups. Um, this, and you guys, are you too young to remember the Green New Deal? How many years was this ago? You know, some of you probably. So we briefly had this thing called the Green New Deal, which I think was just a resolution. Pitney can fact check me on this, but it was not like actionable policy, but, um, AOC uh, rolled this out with some other lawmakers, and there was no mention of cows in this resolution, but there was a FAQ document that accompanied this package, and it said something very offhand about farting cows and getting rid of them. And I mean, it was really snarky, and honestly, that staffer should be ashamed of themselves. Like, it was, it was not made for prime time. Lesson, if you're ever a con congressional staffer, don't be cheeky in the, in the FAQs. This blew up. The, the farmers were mad. I remember I was actually at an ag meeting and it, ugh, they were mad, right? This was not, this did not go over well. This is actually a headline from a dairy trade publication. The Green New Deal progressives really are coming for your beef. Um, and you know, we didn't hear a ton about the Green New Deal after this. This was like a Fox News, kind of, I mean, the, people were really spun up about this, not just for this reason, but this was a big one. Um, so we see in American politics, like in European politics, that going into this territory is very politically risky and you can really incur a lot of wrath, um, not just from farmers, but also just from regular folks who just think the government shouldn't be involved in this at all. Um, another example of this is um, something I covered back in 2016. Um, it was during the Obama administration, there was an effort, well, every five years, the government updates the nutrition advice that we all ignore, okay? No one follows this, <laughs> like they truly don't. There's a lot of data on this. But every five years, the government dutifully goes through and reviews the science, tries to figure out like what, where we're at, what we should be eating. Mostly the guidelines don't change a lot year to year, although every once in a while, there's a little bit of a change and like the news only covers that. Um, but anyway, there was a, committee of experts who thought that we should integrate environmental sustainability into the nutrition guidelines, like that it should be part of the conversation. This idea created an all out war in Washington. Like, and I don't use that term like lightly. It was chaos, the meat groups were angry, the livestock groups were angry, Republicans were angry, some Democrats were angry, farm state Democrats were really angry. I mean, it was just, um, it, a lot, a lot of backlash. And this was just like an idea that came from a committee of experts, right? This was not even close to being actually in the, um, the actual dietary guidelines, which of course everyone ignores. But um, the, the government, even though it was during Obama and like you would think maybe they'd be sort of fine with this, uh, they were not fine. They, ca they caved to this pressure pretty quickly and USDA and HHS, which jointly write the guidelines, were like, no, 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 I think they used the term, we're gonna color within the lines, like, which was, which was very condescending to this committee, but they reined this in quickly, right? So even with a um, administration at the time that was very interested in food, the Obama administration was uniquely interested in food, this was just like a no-go. And in this story, I had this great quote, which I, we'll never forget from um, a food policy expert at NYU. And she said something like, 
if I were a meat lobbyist, I would be breaking out the champagne because by the time the guidelines came out, like there was no mention of reducing meat consumption, which would have been like, the natural outpouring or um, outgrowth of that because, of course, meat has a larger environmental footprint than the vegetables they're always trying to get us to eat, which we're ignoring. <laughs> we really are. So, oh yeah, so just as a reminder, meat per, per capita meat consumption in the U.S. has continued to go up, even though I think there's been, um, I think there actually is a fair amount of consumer um, understanding of the connection between just like the greater environmental footprint of meat consumption. Like, I don't think that that's not known at this point. Um, per capita dairy consumption is also at, I believe, record highs now. So. It's an interesting question, even if the dietary guidelines had told Americans to eat less meat, would we have? I don't, I don't think so, but um, this is the trend that we have. And you know, you see some, some chickens really been doing well, right? <laughs> chickens going, but so, so some things rearranged, but overall um, we're still climbing. So a lot of folks who just crunch the numbers look at this, and then they also look at developing countries who are increasingly with high incomes adopting this diet and they're doing the math going this is not going to work out well in terms of just the total emissions that and also the land use the water use so i think we're definitely on a path where even if governments like the u.s never tell you to not eat less meat maybe they will eventually um it will get more expensive in the future we're not really there yet we're our Food's still relatively very cheap in the U.S. compared to other places, even with the inflation that we've had. But um, this is an overall trend. The, as soon as a country gets more wealth, meat and dairy are the first things that get added to the plate. Um, so we are going to see this continue. Um, interestingly, though, a lot of other countries have integrated sustainability into their dietary guidelines. So this is becoming a global trend. There is some pressure on the U.S. to go in this direction, but politically, it's just been so sensitive that for the past like eight years since that dust up over um, sustainability during the Obama administration, no one has wanted to touch this. So even groups that are advocating for it are, I would say, not super hopeful that it's going to happen in the U.S. anytime soon, but they're still trying to push that forward. Um, and meanwhile like other countries very much are going in that direction and i don't know how much it's going to change consumption but of course livestock groups and meat groups don't like having the government tell you to eat less of their product that it's just not really um not really what they want even if we ignore it um okay so despite all of this the political risk every example you can think of where food and ag and climate kind of come together it's just like kind of a disaster, there actually is a lot that has been changing. And this is a story I wrote in 2019 um, about like ag groups kind of slowly changing their stance on climate. So there was a long time in Washington where if you brought up climate change, the agriculture lobby, farm groups, farm state lawmakers would just be like, A, they would say that climate change was not happening, and B, they would just be like, Absolutely not. Like, just non-starter. Just we're talking like was not something they would gauge on. But during the Trump administration, actually, and maybe even a little bit before that, there was a really significant shift that happened among these agriculture groups and farmers where, A, they were starting to see more extreme weather more frequently. So the attitudes among individual farmers were starting to change in meaningful ways. And all of these agriculture groups started to realize that in it, this transition towards a more climate friendly agriculture or trying to reduce emissions, the pressure that will eventually be on agriculture is unavoidable. And they wanted to lean in, they wanted to be a part of like at least what is coming. And so I ended up doing a series on like how these attitudes were changing, how it was really kind of let, laying the groundwork for maybe some action happening in the US. Um, but it was, you know, small like this was like during the trump administration you have to remember at this time usda officials were also like afraid to use the, the phrase climate change so that was also part of this um series that i did 
talking about how like a lot of farmers who very much believe in the scientific consensus on climate change and we're seeing like really intense floods, rains, derechos, like crazy weather they hadn't seen in their lifetime. They were like, what are we doing? Like, what are we doing about this? Where is the government response? Um, again, at USDA, we have all of this evidence that officials were afraid to use the word climate change. That complicates your response on climate if you can't really talk um, in a forthcoming way about it. So I did this analysis sort of breaking down what, what, what part of USDA's budget was actually spent on like climate mitigation and adaptation. It was like very, very little, um, you know, less than 1%. Um, this was a farmer, Rick Oswald, that I interviewed in Missouri. Um, this was in his farmhouse that was completely trashed, um, had taken on massive floodwaters. This whole property um, was so, it was kind of apocalyptic actually. It was so badly flooded that it had been taken back over by like wetland plants. Like there were cattails everywhere because so many seeds had come in. And then the, the grain bins where he was storing corn they were all split open and it looked like big sand dunes of like rotting corn. And this was like, I can't remember how long after the flooding, but it was like a while, like long enough for there to be plants, like new plants. Um, the roads were all messed up. Like it was a very unsettling look into the devastation that can happen when there's really extreme weather. Um, and doing this analysis of like, what is the government really doing about this and does their response match the reality on the ground was a very interesting um, story to work on. Um, as part of this, I also went to um, Nebraska. By the way, I should be clear, I'm normally just like reading GAO reports in like a cubicle. I'm not usually doing fun stuff on the farm, but every once in a while I do. I talk to farmers a lot, but this was a really fun farm tour. I just don't want to misrepresent journalism as if you're just like traipsing about with, with uh, a recorder in the cornfield. It's fun when you get to, but mostly you're just reading government documents and chasing people around. Um, so this, this was actually visiting a cover crop seed operation. So cover crops are one of the quote climate smart or climate friendly practices that can be adopted on farm um, to help like not only potentially sequester more carbon into the soil, but also help with soil health. So you're keeping the um, farmland covered like it, in plants instead of having bare soil. Um, this is one of the things that the USDA is now like really encouraging farmers to do. Um, and this was a cover crop seed or um, yeah, cover crop seed company that I went to and they're like booming because this is a new interest um, among farmers to really um, add these into the rotations. If you currently drive around the Midwest, it's really common, especially in the winter, to see like just just dirt, like not covered in, in, in um, uh, cover crops. And that's still really mu very much the norm, but um, there's like little seeds, no pun intended, of this, of this change coming. And one of the most interesting things about this is that it is kind of a movement of changing farm practices that's coming from farmers, and it's often farmers on the right. These are, um, sometimes they're even seen kind of as renegades in their communities because they're, they're farming differently. They're focusing on like what some people would call regenerative agriculture, and they may not, they may not ever call it climate smart, climate friendly, even though like it's, th those are the same thing. They might call it something different, and they're not necessarily doing it for the climate benefits. However, talking to a lot of these guys, you'll find that they have found that adding something like cover crops or switching to more quote, climate friendly uh, practices can make their farms more resilient to extreme rains or other um, extreme weather. And so they start to see some of the practical benefits. That said, it costs money, like change how you farm. And this is a very, very slow like transition, I think that's happening. This chart really, really is a good reminder. So I'm curious, how many of you have heard of regenerative agriculture? A lot, okay, I was thinking it'd be like half. So regenerative agriculture is a very buzzy term and it almost perfectly overlaps with climate smart or climate friendly. None of these terms are well-defined and that's why I'm like sometimes using quotes because like loosely, they're, and they're co-opted. So the, the, where there, there are not neat definitions around these things, but 
Cover crops are, I think, kind of a proxy for looking at these issues because it's kind of like low-hanging fruit. That together with no-till, which just means that you're not tilling or um, like turning over the soil, which can also release um, carbon dioxide. So it's sort of like don't release the carbon dioxide and then hopefully put a little bit more in. Um, that's a kind of, I think, rudimentary way of thinking about it. I'm not a scientist, but th this is how it's been explained to me. But this shows you how even though all of you in this room have heard of regenerative agriculture, cover crops, which I would I think are a proxy, not a perfect one, but a proxy for regenerative agriculture. Um, most of this is what zero to one percent, one to five percent. I mean, we're we're not talking about a lot of ground that's using cover crops. Overall, the 2022 census from USDA found that I think 4.7 percent of cropland acres are using cover crops. And that was a 17% increase. That's actually like, you know, the cover crop people are probably popping champagne. They're like, we're growing, this is great. But like, you can just see the scale of what we're talking about here. So even though this is buzzy, not really on the ground all that much, even though we do have for sure a lot of farmers that are pushing this direction, they're, they even become almost evangelical about it. There's a lot of other benefits that are kind of wonky to get into, but you might be able to spend less on fertilizer. You might be able to, um, you know, just reduce the cost of inputs on your farm overall. And there can be some real benefits in terms of like saving money and having better profits. Some of them also can find higher yields, but I think that's um, after like a long time of doing it. It's not one of those things where you're like, magically our yields are better and we have all these climate benefits because I think if that were true, everyone would be doing it. Also, if you drive around still, now you're gonna see a lot of cover crops. Oh, except for, I should say the one exception where the blue is, because I know I'm gonna get asked about this because you guys are sharp. Um, the blue, where you're like, why are there so many cover crops on the East Coast? That is mostly around the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And the reason there are such higher rates of adoption in Maryland, it's actually really high. I think it's, oh, I, mean, I should have pulled this number. I, it's really high. Like I think it's over 40%. Um, it's because those states have increased their incentives for farmers. They actually pay farmers to grow cover crops, and it's part of a broader strategy to try to clean up the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And there's lots of states that um, feed into this, and that's been very successful. But again, it's the question of who's going to pay for it. And in those cases, states have been ponying up additional money, and that has made the difference. So even though USDA does have some incentives for um, cover crops, uh, I think we can clearly say that they're not enough to like tip the whole country because this is what the map looks like. So it's politically toxic. We don't have a lot of cover crops. It's hard to get the UN leaders to talk about climate, although they're kind of getting their climate and food. So for better or for worse, a lot of maybe even the backbone of American climate policy when it comes to food and ag rests on private sector Commitments, corporate commitments. This is this is really the bread and butter of what we're talking about here. And there's a lot of criticism of this because it's like greenwashing, marketing. How much of this is real? Is this just PR? But we're not talking. It is not in the realm of possibility that you're going to be regulating or mandating anything on farms in the U.S. And so this is what we have. This is an example of what Cargill is doing. You know, they're working on soil health. Um, they've committed to a 30% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. Well, that's coming right up. I mean, that's going to be, I don't know how they're doing on that, but um, the, 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 this is hard. This is hard to do, right? But all of these companies, a lot of big food companies have now committed to reducing their emissions. Many of them are trying to be net zero even by 2050. Um, and they're going to try to get reductions across their supply chain. It's a lot easier to just like, you know, buy EV trucks and put solar panels on your roof and change your own power. But once you start getting into what's called scope three, which is like going upstream, oh, just going upstream, uh, that gets really hard. That gets really hard because then you have to convince the farmer that you're buying from, to like fundamentally change their operation just because you made a corporate commitment. Who pays for it is really going to be the key issue here. And this is going to be, you have to fix that or you have to answer that or that none of this will work. Here's another example from General Mills. They want to reduce 
greenhouse gas emissions by 30% by 2030 and be net zero by 2050. You can only imagine how many grains General Mills is using. We've all seen the cereals. I mean, we're talking about a lot of acres that are going to have to reduce um, their environmental footprint on dairy. Um, this requires investment and how the extent to which these companies are going to be footing the bill for that transition, it really remains to be seen. Um, I did a newsletter a while back. Um, this was actually one of my guest writers when I was out on maternity leave, looking at like, what have all these corporate commitments gotten us? And I think my biggest takeaway here was that so far, these corporate commitments have gotten us much more accurate accounting of the problem or the direction that these companies are going in terms of emissions. Um, it's important to track things, like it's important to have accounting, but you know, there's no consequence for not meeting these commitments. And I don't want to like minimize what these companies are doing. These are large scale companies that have like a lot of people dedicated to this. Many of them have very serious commitment. Many of them, I think, have pretty questionable commitment, but they still put out their, <laughs> their CSR reports. They are still, you know, putting out goals. We don't know what's going to happen when a lot of these companies can't meet these goals. Um, we will have to see. And actually, we'll see how much the media even covers them not meeting their goals. But um, it's just a really hard thing to do. And some of these companies that have been doing better accounting, we're actually finding that their emissions are increasing while they're trying to cut them. So again, it's good to have the accounting. It's good to have that measurement of progress or lack thereof. But it is fundamentally different than um, having any sort of forcing mechanism. I mean, we're just not going to have that. So um, this, is, this is just where we are. Um, I should also mention the Inflation Reduction Act does have um, several billion dollars to try to incentivize more climate friendly practices. And that's on top of like USDA conservation programs we have, which do um, really try to um, encourage farmers and also support them with resources to do a lot of these climate smart, climate friendly practices. Um, but it's not enough money to like transition the whole country and it's highly voluntary. So the big, big buzzword when you talk about climate and agriculture in the US, in Congress, whatever, if you ever t tune into a hearing, you will hear over and over again, voluntary, 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 voluntary incentive base, voluntary. I mean, this is this is the key because nobody wants to step in that bee's nest and there is no political path for doing that anyway. So watch those corporate commitments. I think this is going to be where all the action is. So that brings us to the marketplace starting to have a chaotic sort of personality about, about regenerative, climate smart, carbon neutral. Like Again, we don't even really have defined terms. I guess climate or carbon neutral is sort of self-explanatory. But in that case, it's the dairy company where they're buying carbon offsets and then they're trying to transition the dairies to um, you know, capture more of their methane on um, like their manure lagoons, like it, that's also a, considered a climate smart practice. So instead of releasing that methane up into the atmosphere, trying to repurpose it for fuel. But again, you can imagine that takes infrastructure investments. Um, so there's neutral carbon neutral milk, climate smart cereal. This is good rice, by the way, it's a California product. I, they didn't pay me to say that, but it's regenerative organic certified, which I don't even know. Um, USDA organic is regulated and there's clear standards around it. But I do wonder if we are eventually going to a place where climate smart might be a more standardized term where there could be a premium. Because if there's a premium, then we can get back to that question of like, who's going to pay? Who's going to pay for this? Who's going to pay for these different practices? Who's going to pay for this more climate friendly way of farming that everyone says they want or consumers say they want or UN leaders say they want? Um, it's all going to come down who pays for it. Um, and then the Patagonia beer is just fun. It's made out of Kernza, which is like a perennial grain. Um, and it, I actually haven't had it, but the climate could use a beer as a great marketing line. <laughs> I think that's very cute. Um, so you're going to see these terms crop up. And I get asked, like, how reliable is, is this? Like, should we trust these labels? And I think there's a lot of greenwashing. Um, you, if you really care about this and you want to buy something that really has 
probably some teeth behind it. You want to look for third party certifications of some kind or any kind of independent verification that is a real um, like that's a kind of a sign of seriousness, but that doesn't guarantee that it's not greenwashing. The pragmatists in this world who work in this space would say, we really need consumers to just buy this stuff and pay a premium for it, even though it may not be real now, because we need market signals to add on to the government signal. Like the incentives need to be there. And like, would there one day be a, a time when this would get a premium like organic or like, you know, cage free or different, um, or different like labels we have. So I don't know. I think this would be very difficult to do. You would also have to like bifurcate the supply chain. There's a lot of really boring things that would have to like happen for this to work. Um, but this seems to be sort of the general direction that we may be going. We might start to see more like climate smart commodities, kind of like we see organic commodities. Um, but in the meantime, good luck figuring out the labels. Um, I do not vouch for them, but I, I understand why they're marketing this. This is particularly um, a way to ap appeal to Gen Z consumers, which is many of you in this room, because, you know, rightly, a lot of people are concerned about um, the climate response and sort of like what individual actions can be taken to contribute to that. So presidential election. <laughs> we talked about the dietary guidelines, which no one follows. Um, but that actually has been, this has come up on the campaign trail. It hasn't gotten a ton of media coverage, except for this, there have been a little a couple of fact checks like this one. But Essentially, what happened is that Vice President Kamala Harris, before she was vice president, when she was running for president in 2019, she got asked during a CNN town hall um, whether or not she supported the dietary guidelines urging people to eat less meat because of concerns about climate. And she said she would. And, um, you know, I don't think this really got attention at the time. I don't think she was doing very well in the, in the primary, but I don't really remember. But this this is something that I went back and watched recently. Well, the Trump campaign definitely watched this because it's been uh, one of uh, former President Trump's uh, talking points. It's actually come up quite a bit on the campaign trail lately. He says that Kamala Harris is going to take away your cows and ban beef. And I mean, it's just a real, it's a very dramatic thing. Of course, that is not true. She said that she would support the dietary guidelines, which no one follows, to tell people to eat less meat. Though, ser seriously, that is still a very controversial concept. I was recently at a presidential forum in Washington where um, both campaigns had a surrogate, and I asked the surrogate for Kamala Harris if she had a current position on this because I was wondering if the position had changed because she's now running for president. And he had a very diplomatic response, a guy named Rod Snyder, who, who just left EPA and the Biden administration, and I'm sure he knew exactly that this would come up but he said something like i'm not familiar with her current policy or her current position on this topic and i was like yeah i'm sure you're not but um <laughs> but it's i i don't know you know i don't know what her position would be and you know does the president's position on this really matter because it's mostly handled by government officials at a lower level um but i do think it will be interesting to see depending on who gets into the White House, whether or not food issues and climate get a little bit more traction. Kamala Harris actually really loves to cook. She's kind of a foodie. I You could see a world where maybe she'd be like, yeah, let's talk about food more. I don't know. It's possible. I don't. Um, and everyone goes to the pork tent at the Iowa Fair. So like every politician has this photo of flipping pork. Like, I'm not joking. Go look it up in Getty Images. It's really common. So who knows? I don't know what her current position is on meat and dietary guidelines. It's actually fascinating that she even got asked it. I mean, these these issues do not usually come up during campaigns. Um, and the fact that Trump is using it as a as a rallying cry during his um, uh, you know stump speeches kind of shows you that he knows this is a way to rally people um, and a way to really kind of poke at the government, not telling people what to eat. Although, of course, he's just saying they're banning it, which isn't true. So the note we're going to end on is that food is complicated. It's personal. We have a very long history in this country of using food as a way to send signals about identity and class. And you know, food is it's personal. Like, we all eat. Um, a lot of the White House press corps like went ballistic over this photo because it was so terrible that Trump had, I think 
there's maybe Burger King and McDonald's. I don't remember what all was served, but there was a sports team visiting and people were like, this is so terrible. You should have, you know, they have all these chefs. They should have served them something nice. They came all the way to the White House. But I think Trump knew exactly what he was doing with this photo. I think it conveys uh, like every man sort of uh, image, you know, even though I'm in the White House, like most people in America eat fast food and I'm going to eat fast food here too. And I think this kind of gets at like, food is always a little bit more than it seems. You can't just treat it like energy policy where you're like, I mean, do you really care as much about like what kind of electricity your home is powered by? Well, probably not. But like food is something that people have like more um, emotional connection to. And I think that's one of the reasons in addition to farmers not being, they don't want to be told what to do. It's sort of those com the combination of that that makes this issue so politically fraught. And of course, this is not just a Trump thing. This is a great picture, Ben. Uh, this is a Polk County Democrat steak fry. I don't know what it is about Iowa and these grilling pictures, but they're very into them. Um, you know, of course, we have lots of pictures of Joe Biden eating ice cream. He likes to eat simple foods. I that's the word on the street. And it is a way to kind of convey, like, I'm like you. And so um, as I think... Maybe this is just an American thing that our politicians are going to convey, you know, that they're just like us. They like to eat meat and um, they don't want to piss off farmers. So I think that is a good, a good way to sum up why this is really hard. Um, and this is just a great picture of Joe Biden. So enjoy it because he's on his way out. So yeah. um, anyway, I want to end, end on that happy note. Um, well, not that Joe Biden's leaving, but he looks so happy in that photo. Um, if you are interested in food policy, you can sign up for my newsletter, foodfix.co. I will totally comp you if you're, if you email me because I love Claremont. Um, and yeah, I want to thank you guys for your interest. And before we take questions, I know you guys are going to have really good questions. I want to give my mom a special shout out who's in the back with my four month old baby. Oh, she has help now. <laughs> um, my mom is a big part of the reason I ended up at CMC, big part of me writing. She's the best. So thanks, mom. Oh. oh, awesome. Thank you again for such an awesome talk. It was so enlightening and it was wonderful to hear you speak and learn so much from a CMC alum especially. Um, so now we move on to the wonderful Q&A portion of the evening. So if you have a question, please come on up, say your full name, first and last name, your major, your school, and then share your brief question for our speaker. Hi, my name is Annie Voss. Um, I go to Pitzer. I'm a junior and I'm an environmental science major and I'm from Athens, Ohio, which is like close to the West Virginia border. And I guess my question for you is I'm I grew up on a farm. I come from a very long line of farmers and I am far and away the very first person in my family to have ever even considered a science degree. And I think that science and agriculture have had this sort of interesting relationship where they don't always like each other. Science liking agriculture a little bit more <laughs> than agriculture likes science. Mm -hmm. And I often feel like scientists end up coming with these big ideas to farmers who have very realistic budget concerns and kind of uh, annoy them oh, yeah. with their ideas. And I guess I wonder, like in your reporting, what ways of communicating science to farmers have you found most effective? And what do you think is causing that? It's a great question. What kind of what kind of farm? Just curious. Um, it used to be corn and soybeans. Now it's hay. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Um, great. So science communication. I think doesn't matter 
as much as we think it does for someone who is farming because, and I'm not saying that in a, they don't care, but they're living farming and they're taking on all that risk. And most of them have been doing it for a very long time. I don't think I mentioned the average age of farmers, like definitely over 60. I mean, we're talking about very experienced professional farmers, right? They, they don't need to be told what to do. Um, so I don't know how much science communication is the issue. What I see more is that their individual experience of extreme weather can change minds about the climate changing. It might not change whether or not they believe the same reason that climate, like what's driving climate change, but that almost doesn't matter. As soon as you accept that their climate change is happening, we need to adapt, uh, you, there's a lot of common ground there. What I see is generationally, um, this is much easier. So when kids take over their parents' operation, that's a more, uh, that's often a time when you'll see more regenerative practices at least tried um, because you don't have as much of that like life experience um, going into that. But farmers do pay attention to a lot of science. It's just like, it has to align with making a living. There's just certain things that it has to align with and that makes sense, right? They're not just gonna be like, well, yeah, for fun, I'm gonna do this because someone in Washington told me that's just not gonna work. There has to be incentives there. I also think there another part of it, which I've come to understand the more I've spent time with farmers is there's a really common saying in agriculture that farmers are the original conservationists. And if you go to most farms, they're they're beautiful, like the air is really clean and they're looking around going, anyone who's telling me that I'm degrading the environment is nuts, right? And even though, you know, there's lots of evidence that we have a lot of runoff in the Gulf of Mexico, we have a lot of runoff in a lot of the uh, fresh water in the Midwest, there's a lot of evidence, but their farm isn't, you know, there's just a disconnect there. And I don't know that you bridge that with like communication. I really don't, but it's a good question. Let me know if you figure it out. Yeah. Or let USDA know that's their job. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Claire. I'm a senior here at CMC. I also grew up on a small farm in I Montana. That. I feel like we didn't have any farmers <laughs> when, when I was here. I love that. Um, my question for you is, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how we can incorporate environmental policies into agriculture, um, especially to not leave out small farmers' voices, because I know a lot of the environmental policies put extra restrictions um, that require you know, more money, or, more yeah, incentives. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's harder for small farmers to keep up with that. So how do we make sure that those aren't left out of the conversation? Yeah, this is such a good question. We didn't even get into like carbon offsets or carbon credits or different ways that a farmer might get some financial incentives for storing carbon. There's a whole other, you should have someone come to an ath talk on that if you haven't, carbon offset market. Woo. Lots of complexity. But small farms almost can, it almost never makes sense for small farms to participate in that because of the paperwork, the overhead costs, everything you just mentioned. Um, our agriculture policy is really not designed to incentivize small farms, small and medium, really even small and medium farms. Most of the history of American ag is um, pushing towards bigger and bigger farms. And I think it's something like, you know, it's just like a few thousand farms that grow like a, the vast majority of our food. Like it really has consolidated a lot over time. And um, I think if you wanted to integrate environmental policy in a way that would really focus on small farms, um, that would be something that small farmers would have to get really organized to do and go to Congress and be really loud. And there is some of that that happens. There is some, um, you know, grassroots organizing that happens to engage with, particularly on the Senate side, like every, you know, they all all represent states with agriculture. There's a farm bureau in every state. Um, but it's, it's very difficult because we didn't really set up our ag policy to help small farms. The USDA will kind of say that they do, but if you just look at who gets the money, that's just not the case. So I think you'd have to go to Capitol Hill and it would be an uphill battle. Is that optimistic or <laughs> too, that's, that's probably the reality of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Caleb. I'm a first year at CMC. Are you also from a farm? Cause every, I'm, I'm, I'm not from a strange. farm, unfortunately. I, I wish, but, um, I'm majoring in economics and math, but I found this really interesting because sustainability is something that interests me a lot. 
And in my senior year of high school, I actually learned a lot about regenerative agriculture oh, really? from an environmental science class. And I was sort of interested, you talked a lot about sort of how the government has been slowly getting involved in uh, educating farmers and promoting regenerative agriculture. We don't use the term regenerative, but yes, some of the practices. Okay, well, yes, yes, something yes. akin to yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm curious if you know of any nonprofits that have been working in that space, and if so, if they've had any success. Yeah, most, I really think most of the adoption for, quote, regenerative uh, practices or regenerative agriculture has been from the grassroots. I really think that that is more the case. And it'll be like neighbor to neighbor. The other question about science communication, I think neighbors are more important. Like my neighbor did this, it worked. They're at the coffee shop, they're talking. There's like a lot of cross pollination happening. There's also a lot of like negativity around like so-and-so is doing something differently and his his farm looks kind of trashy. I mean, I mean, it, like I, it's kind of funny, but it's not. Like there's a lot of that happening. I don't know that any nonprofits have had a lot of success um, changing like USDA policy or congressional policy, but there are this coalition that I wrote about with the ag groups coming together with the environmental groups like Environmental Defense Fund, Environmental Working Group, um, Nature Conservancy. They've kind of teamed up with the Farm Bureau to work on at least standardizing some of the carbon credit stuff going on to try to make that a little bit easier for farmers to navigate. That's really where we've seen more action. And they have banded together on that. So those would have been, you know, m more of the larger environmental groups kind of teaming up with big ag groups is where we've seen that. But it hasn't done anything to like mandate anything. It's more like trying to make sure that USDA policy helps farmers if they do want to participate in like a carbon offset market or something like that. So with your economics focus, yeah. you can go figure that one out because that's a whole other um, market. Goal. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, um, my name is Kana. Um, I'm a Pitzer student, EA or environmental analysis major. Um, and I guess on the other end of the food system, uh, my parents actually own a restaurant in San Diego. Um, and I guess I was thinking I'm really appreciative of how you uh, concluded your talk, talking about how food is extremely personal. And I think that is something that gets dismissed often when we think about um, consumption of food and putting it on the consumer. Of course, you're in the sphere of politics and thinking from a much more upscale approach, but at the end of the day, all politicians are still consumers of food and they have impact on um, the market of food. And in what ways do you think consumers have, I, I think the discourse of consumer responsibility, but how much responsibility do consumers really have? I guess I'm just wondering like your personal thoughts about that as being someone in food politics, but also ultimately being a human that eats um, and thinking about like where you think consumers need to be more mindful and in what ways are consumers already being too mindful about the ways that we're affecting an already broken food system? Yeah, this this is a great question. Um, has anyone seen Food Inc. in here? Did you guys watch the first one? I feel like you guys are interested in food. Second this one. is so great. But there's a second one, yes. So I'm getting to that. The first Food Inc. which came out like, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. The first Food Inc. was all about um, trying to convince consumers to make different choices to like, you know, basically buy your way into the food system we, we want or consumers want a better food system. Buy your way, vote with your dollars, that's what it said. And I recently was at the Food Inc. 2 premiere in Washington and I actually got to moderate the panel with Eric Schlosser and Michael Pollan and everyone. And this was really full circle because I had read Eric Schlosser's Fast Food Nation and I wrote my CMC admissions essay on Ray Kroc, I really did. And so I got to sit with these folks and they're the ones who did this movie. And the biggest takeaway they had and why they did Food Inc. 2 was they were like, we realized that policy really matters. Like that there's only so far you can go just asking people to like vote with their dollars. Um, and they're really, their big focus, which was interesting, wasn't really part of the first Food Inc, was all about concentration and consolidation and the role that that has played in like sort of locking in the food system that we have. So it's probably kind of both, but I think it's interesting to see some of the biggest critics of the food system have sort of come around to the idea that actually policy is 
much more important than trying to rely on consumer, like changing consumer taste. Although certainly that does matter. And paying more for climate smart food is something that one day could be a real lever. Like we don't know. So it's a bit of a mix, I think. But it's a good question. Yeah. And I hope their restaurant's doing great. Food prices are really high. Good luck. Oh no. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Oh. Hi, I'm Eddie. I'm a senior here at CMC. I study economics and international relations, and I'm originally from Iowa. So thanks for the shout out for all those state have fairs. You been to a state I have, fair? I have. <laughs> Pork fails are pretty good. Um, my question relates to more of the innovative approaches to tackling the food problem. You know, research and development going into things like cultivated meat, lab grown meat. Do you think there's ever going to be a time or space for these mechanisms um, to address the food crisis that we're going through? Yeah, so we have seen a lot of venture capital investment, especially when we had like 0% interest rates and there was just like cash like everywhere to be had for all these entrepreneurs. We saw a lot go into food and ag tech, really record amounts um, that has since very much been reined in. But one of the top things that was funded by venture capital was cell cultivated meat companies so and seafood. So trying to figure out, can we grow um, you know, meat without slaughtering animals, can we grow those cells and like create products out of it? Um, that has not gotten very far. It did, um, we did get actually some regulatory approvals for cell cultivated chicken, but no one has figured out how to make this in a commercially viable way. So you currently can't buy it anywhere, which is kind of wild, but it made it all the way through the regulatory process, which took years and you can't buy it anywhere right now. I actually had it in Washington, the texture is not quite there. Very close, but the flavor, I mean, it really is close, um, but it's not economically viable right now. So for it to work, there's gonna have to be a lot more R&D and there's actually a push right now to try to move it away from being so focused on these venture funded companies and move it more into the public sector and you know, have, there is some USDA funding now around um, cell cultivate or like cellular agriculture. And so if you could try to um, give it more time in that setting, there are some people that are hopeful that maybe it would make more advances. But right now, it doesn't seem like anyone's figured out how to produce it at any kind of scale that would be affordable. So maybe one day, but not soon. Yeah. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm a sophomore at CMC. My question is about the protests in Europe, and I'm wondering if you saw that as a step forward or a step back with like starting the conversation around agriculture or turning like regenerative agriculture, those ideas into like the wasp nest that it is here. That's a good question. I don't know that I'm a f astute enough observer of European politics, which are so complicated and every country is different. Um, generally, I think this has created a, a, an environment where there's a lot of hesitancy about going into that. Um, even though there's been a ton of backlash, I don't think a ton of the policies, if you were to go through individual countries, have actually like come to fruition. Like, are they actually, I think one of them was removing diesel subsidies. One of them was um, trying to reduce how much livestock, I think in the Netherlands it was around livestock because they're worried about um, uh, nitrogen pollution there. And those have not come to pass. So I guess it started a conversation around that connection. And I think more like consumers understand that. But when I was in the Netherlands a couple of, or like a year ago, I was asking like my, I think I was a ta in a taxi and I was like, what do you think about? And he was like, oh, I'm on the farmer's side. Like, you know, and we were in Amsterdam. Like he was like, I'm with the farmers, you know? So it, it's not as simple as just like, oh, now we're aware. So we're going to go do something like it really is. Um, it really is difficult to break through that. And um, even I think we're seeing some like consumers and also some populist figures on the right who maybe don't really care about agriculture are, are kind of like glomming onto that and like giving it more fuel. So there's some interesting alliances forming there. And I don't know that that will result in a lot of like changed policy. Um, but I can guarantee you that politicians in the U.S. have looked at those pictures going, yeah. I mean, it's not politically possible here anyway, but it's a good reinforcement, I think, for folks who don't think Washington should do any more 
to say like, if we did, it would be, it would look like this. And actually there are past examples. I think during the Carter administration, when there was a, the grain embargo, I believe farmers actually released livestock in USDA. There were tractors all over the mall. I mean, this was so, they'll show up if they're mad. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Talia. I'm a senior here at CMC, majoring in economics. Um, apologies if this question is a little bit too econ, but I do think it's quite relevant. So I one of the... really avoided econ when I was here. I, just <laughs> that. I was basically a double gov major. If that um, was well, one of the questions you've been posing tonight is who's going to pay for this? Um, and I was just wondering, how do you go about even calculating the amount by which either the consumer or the producer is going to pay for this? You know, um, and then even looking at subsidizing alternatives, like how do you calculate that? on a cost benefit analysis and how does that um, impact farmers on like an individual level? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't know. I don't know how you do that. That's a great thesis if someone wants to write it, like trying to estimate how much it would cost. There, there may be some think tank work on like trying to estimate, like what would it take to transition all or most of American agriculture to this more like regenerative, I don't know. but it would be complicated because it wouldn't just be the cost of like changing practice, but it would also be in some cases the cost to yield, especially if um, individual farmers don't want to do that or are not going to change their management markedly. Like, I mean, there, it would be, there would be a lot of costs in addition to the actual financial costs of like paying for them to transition to different practices. Um, and also if they were going to shift to different crops, there would be, I mean, the ripple effects, that's a great thesis. You should do that. What year are you? Yeah. I'm a senior, yeah. Oh, okay, well, maybe <laughs> yeah. give the idea to someone else, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, hi, my name's Ariana. I'm a sophomore at Scripps studying philosophy, and I'm not from a farm, but I did work on an organic farm in Indiana last summer, so that was my first time in the Midwest. Very cool, very Growing hot. fruits and vegetables? Fruits and vegetables, there were alpacas, there were chickens. But uh, my question is actually about agritourism, that the farm that I was on was very focused on sustainable um, legislature, sustainable just practices in general. But many of the farms that we had the opportunity to visit were these very right-leaning, were, we were run by these very right-leaning families, and they were all family farms, but they wouldn't hear word of climate change. And instead, they were focusing on agrotourism as a way to plant sunflowers, which are cover crops. So there were miles and miles of sunflower mazes, like the largest in Indiana. Is it that so that people see. could post it on Instagram? Most likely, yeah. for sure. But my question is, do you think that agritourism is going to be a way that like right wing or right leaning farms are going to be more sustainable moving like financially forward? Financially sustainable, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I don't know that it would be particularly right leaning farms, though certainly farmers uh, skew quite conservative. Not all of them, but definitely a uh, majority of them. I, I think it is a way for, so agritourism would be like if your Airbnb, ha, like if you're, if you go to an Airbnb and it's a tiny house on a farm, that's one of the things. And so they're getting a lot of income and actually they can get a lot more income doing Airbnb sometimes than selling at farmer's markets, depending on what uh, they're doing. Um, I think it can be a way to kind of make the keeping the farm more so financially stable because you have other forms of income. The other thing to know about American farming is like most farmers are getting like health care from a spouse or some, you know, maybe both of them actually work off farm or at least one works off farm to have like some stable income. Um, agritourism and also like weddings on farms can be a huge moneymaker for um, like I know a lot of former dairies as like dairy prices have gone below the cost of production for a lot of dairy farmers, they might turn their dairy barn into a cleaned up <laughs> wedding venue and you see that a lot and I bet you they're making more money as a wedding venue which tells you a lot about a lot of things but yeah yeah it's a good question I do think that is happening in a lot of places awesome so just for in the interest of time we're gonna elapse the Q&A session but if any questions were not answered um, please go to like the back of the Athenaeum and I'm sure if she has any more time, she's going to be more than happy to answer them. But I just want to take the time to thank you so much, Helena, for your insightful talk tonight. Uh, you shed light on the critical issues surrounding food, agriculture, and climate change. And we deeply appreciate your work in tackling these complex issues. Your stories from Washington and your experiences as a journalist have given us a lot to think about. 
On behalf of everyone here, thank you for your time and for sharing your expertise with us this evening. Thank you.